Hello, everyone, and welcome to this free episode of TF is free. It's Thursday. Yes, it's the free episode. How is everybody? Hussein and Alice. Mm, it's the free one. I was trying to be, do the ghost thing. Uh-huh. Didn't really. I, I, no, I was saying it, and then I realized, oh, no, this just sounds like my normal voice, but slightly <laughs> slowed down. <laughs> yeah. Is, is this where we realize that you've been dead and from the 1800s the whole time? Uh, also, yeah. you never <laughs> aged above 10. And and I'm still licking one lollipop. It hasn't, like, <laughs> the size hasn't changed. I'm at this Ozu screening <laughs> at the BFI, and I'm like, why is there this 10-year-old haunted ghost child here? Mm. This remarkable young man who said he would rather go see Ozu. Uh, I don't know. Finish, finish that sentence yourself. One ticket for Tokyo Story, please. Okay, no more ghost children. The ghost children have been exercised. We got Russell Crowe in here to exercise the uh-huh, ghost children. Uh-huh. They're all gone. Just met this remarkable young man who said he'd rather go see Tokyo Story than vote Tory. <laughs> see, this is this is the thing. This configuration of the three of us is a, a, a sort of a rare kind of chaos, right? Because it gives me and Hussein the chance to be the like bad kids in school, which we never really do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you you guys are always sitting really close to the front of the bus, and Milo's back there smoking and and uh, you know like throwing mm-hmm, stuff out the yeah. bus window and, and things of that nature. And now, the good <laughs> students are all revolting. <laughs> Can't believe it. Mm. I want to talk about a bunch of stuff because um, we have uh, some news. We have a startup, and then of course a rare. We got to do a rare buddy check on the FT. I'm afraid. Uh, okay. Everyone knows that we in the FT. Uh, we get along very well, mm-hmm. but when your buddy gets out of line, you got to check your buddy. Mm, Rob Smith has been saying stuff. <laughs> That's true on the streets. No, I, the thing is, right? We're not loyal, and we, you know, you know this about us. This is a price of being friends with our podcast: is that we have no loyalty to anyone. Um, the, the reason why we like the FT, Alice, would you say we got no loyalty that we're demons? That we're like a demon. How can you trust a podcast that's like a demon? No, th- the reason why we like the FT is because they do good journalism. But the reason why they do good journalism is because that's the place where like power goes to read the news, right? And they want actual news. Uh, this also means that they, you know, do some ideology, um, and we have to go like demon mindset on them. Yeah, we got we got to we we got to choke him out with a pair of Margella gloves on. <laughs> a series of incomprehensible references. Yeah, they're comprehensible to us. Um all right, but well, first I want to start out with a little bit of Australian excellence and inexcellence. Ah, okay, a land of contrast. Yeah. Yeah, Austra- finally Australia has produced a, a contrast mm. because Australia must have had their top scientists working on this for a while, but an Australian company has produced and is now marketing a, this is, this is to me, this is similar to like a kind of production level cure for cancer generic, a roast chicken vape juice. They did it. Great. Great. You know how a bunch of leftists got very excited when Cuba sort of debuted their lung cancer vaccine? For the Uh left tendency that we are, this is that. This is the roast chicken vape juice is now a reality. I mean, look, there. I had some great roast chicken when I was in Australia. I'm yeah. very excited for this. What if you could have um, breathed it in? What if I could have, like, yeah, what if I could breathe it in and blow it out all the time? So we will be ordering a 55 gallon drum of this to the studio. Yeah. <laughs> using using it just for any number of purposes, cologne. It's in the sort of like the grey water system. So if you like wash your hands, you know, you get like some a little bit of roast chicken in there too. I love this to the degree that so like in com- combination with the death of the uh, of the elf bar, which I also am very much supportive of, hmm. because it does mark the return of like the o- the OG vapor. Sure. Um, the guys, well, the, ri- who- the big rig. Yeah, the gu- the guys with the big rigs who spent a very long time learning how to blow rings within rings, only to then be like unsert by like fucking idiots mm. uh, who don't even who don't who don't even know how to do any tricks. <laughs> are you suggesting that people who vape with elf bars are posers? Yeah. I think they're fake. I'm just picturing you in the front row of the BFI South Bank watching Ozu <laughs> blowing smoke rings with a giant vape rig like Cape oh. Fear. <laughs> that would be that would be so good. One of one of my favorite things that I found when when like this was years ago, when I went to a vape convention actually. Uh-huh. Uh for work reasons 
Um, there was a guy with a big vape rig and it had a no fear sticker on it. And I thought that was like one of the best things I've ever seen. And he blew like such a, he blew vape rings really well. And I want that to come back, but the vape rings are all chicken, roast chicken and mm. like olive tapenades, uh, smoked salmon roe. This is yeah. the first one of, we hope many, and we will keep you posted on the progress of the savory vape movement. Mm. Can I can I also mention another Australian thing that I thought I found, but actually Andrew Law found, mm. um, which is that apparently there is a wine called Goon Wine in Australia. It's, that's all bagged wine. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's like a bag of goon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you spin the goon. You were just gooning with your friends. Uh, I don't see what's wrong <laughs> yeah, with that. But, some would call it a wine cellar, but I call it a goon cave. Take me back. Take me uh, back. But, but that's all excellent out of Australia. But um. Unfortunately, and again, this is lots of people have asked us to talk about this. Uh, a, a billionaire property developer has been caught on film at a conference saying that unemployment should be higher so that asset prices go up again. Crazy. Uh, Kel surprise. Um, but what I found, this guy, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Gurner. Tim Gurner. Yeah, Tim, Tim, yeah, Tim Gurner. Gurner. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, Tim Gurner. Tim Gurner has been gurning. In my gun cave. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> that's that's what you they call the room where you go to MDMA <laughs> alone. Yeah, I'm just checking out of my Gurn cave, <laughs> swinging my jaw. Uh, yeah, Tim, um, Tim Gooner has uh, decided uh, to get back, and uh, this guy loves being in the news and for people to hate him. Like yeah, he was yeah. the guy who said avocado toast is why people can't buy house. He was the person that said that in 2017. It's just more of the same. In fairness. We had been hanging out a lot at that point, and as you know, I do eat about 28,000 portions of avocado po uh, toast a day, so... Yeah, that's right. I think he kind of just generalized from me. Just just distilled down into a vial of vape liquid, to the essence of 28,000. Yeah, my, my sort of, my vape juice that's avocado toast, it costs like $100,000 per vial, uh, and that's why I can't buy a house. He said, you know, that... Um, Employees need to feel like lucky to end their jobs, and they need to be scared of employers again. The usual shit. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, there's nothing but, new to say about this other than yeah, no. It, there's one new thing. Ah, uh. one new thing, which is I got to see an element of his personality that I found to be very at once interesting and pathetic. Okay, which is that in addition to being this. He is also um, sort of experimenting. One of these rich guys who's trying to experiment with immortality. Oh, okay, like the horrid billionaire that like uh, we see all the time. Yeah, but <laughs> but unlike uh, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys, uh, fucking <laughs> Tim Gooner doesn't even have a blood boy. I mean, if you don't have a blood boy, you're not taking this seriously. All he's done is created a chain of like more expensive Australia only Equinox gyms and like says, oh, you can have like a like a protein kombucha here. He doesn't have a blood boy. Uh -huh. He's not measuring his dick and he d and he's not selling an extra virgin olive oil that's supposed to make you live longer. I hate to say I hate to give it to Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys, but Tim Gooner does not have the chutzpah to be uh -huh. one of these immortal, immortal although, fellow. He's no Immortan Joe. Although, He's no Immortan Brian. Tim Gunnar is an elf bar to Brian Wilson's uh, big no fear vape ring. Mm. Although what if what if he's what if he's right though? What if that like none of the blood boy shit, none of the dick injections, none of those save Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys and let him live to the age of forever? But opening a sort of Australian chain of gyms turns out to be unexpectedly the thing that does it, <laughs> and we're just stuck with this guy like Koshai the Deathless. <laughs> well, what I think is really funny though is that. So he goes on the Australian Financial Review, says unemployment needs to be higher, people need to be afraid of their boss, the usual trolling shit. But then, because he forgot that he now, since he did the 2017 thing, now also owns a business with many employees, he's not just like a, a property owner, he had to then like reassure his employees, like, I didn't mean you, people that work <laughs> at my chain of equinoxes. <laughs> um, which then led to him issuing an ap apology specifically to Australia's noble tradies. Oh. So, uh, we salute you. Mm -hmm. The one the one country where you can hoon and goon at the same time. I mean, I think that's that's <laughs> gorgeous. Yeah, so, uh, Tim Gooner, first case of Australian inexcellence uh, that we have uh, covered on uh, this Lex show, aside Green from all Sill, of the things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, aside from all the other stuff. <laughs> um, I, I want to do a little bit of news, though. Mm. Uh, Britain news. Oh, it's the worst kind. Yeah, well, it's not as there's no as far as I know, there's not a single gooner in Britain. 
<laughs> There's uh, there are a few things I, I'm now sort of adding to the uh, the no fun Britain chronicles. Mm. The the nanny state, not in the sense that the right uses it, which is just like saying like, hey, we'll give you health care so you don't die, for example. But a kind of nanny state in terms of um, embodying the most curtain twitching hall monitorish ten- tendencies of the British psyche. The psycho nanny state. We've talked about this. Yeah. Scolding you like your grand did. Hmm. Yes, exactly. So I don't, if, I don't know if that's everyone's experience of their cram. So like that is not representative. Maybe that's just me projecting my own. My my, my my grand just had kind of like a, a contradictory series of both being racist but also extremely Irish Republican. So <laughs> is is that what the government is doing? I would kind of support that to be honest. <laughs> You know, like qualified in a qualified way, like critical support. If they adopted like my grandmother's policies of like just blasting rebel songs out of Ten Downing Street to annoy the neighbors. <laughs> so, one of the things that's uh, that's coming up in the No Fun Britain Chronicles is, of course, the long-awaited promise of a crackdown on shoplifting, led, of course, by the Mirror. Uh, which is suggesting that um, if you see a anyone shoplifting, you should send a video into the mirror. Yeah, all- which, of course, we should say as a show, if you have any fun videos, then I'm sure the mirror would love to see them. I, I think the thing is, you whenever don't abuse that. It's serious. It's for the news, <laughs> That's right? You wouldn't. Don't fuck you wouldn't with abuse it. the news. So the thing that always happens when we talk about shoplifting in this country is the thickest. Cunts in the entire country go ah, but you know what? People aren't shoplifting to like feed their families or for necessity. They're shoplifting in order to like, in an organized way, to sell on basic necessities. To don't worry about it. This definitely makes a difference to my argument that there's this extra step of a middleman involved. In a, in a, in a la- yeah in a, in, a, in a country where there are lots of professional middlemen and where in many cases your ambition uh growing up is to be a well-paid middleman. Hmm. Uh, it is a crime to now be a middleman. Yeah. Says a lot about society. I, I don't think anybody is living that high on the hog or that like aspirationally as a reseller of baby formula. Right? And I don't think that that's the kind of or- uh, you know, I mean on on StockX you can get some you can get some serious deals. <laughs> yeah. I mean so, you know, but speaking of baby formula, like you know, uh, I had to run an errand for friend of the show, producer of the show, Nate. There was a very specific kind of baby formula that was very difficult to find. Uh, if there was some, and you know, maybe there's someone who stole all of that specific kind of baby formula and was reselling it on stock. Uh, see, see, piracy it hurts legitimate buyers. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't download a baby formula. <laughs> uh, that like shot like the. Idea that shoplifting is something that people do for fun or a lark, or one step on the value chain that people buying their groceries from people who steal them at a cut rate doesn't somehow reflect that the cost of living has gone way up, prices have gone way up, and wages fucking haven't for the vast majority of people. Like, I always come back to, yes, wage growth is very high. Where? In what sector? What's leading it? And again, it's the highest wages, like like the in financial services, for example, mm-hmm. that have big bonuses. The Bank of England report states again and again and again, those are the wages that are growing. And so, you know, the idea that, and, and, and again, like this is the, the rally round the um, idea that this is to be a, the source of yet another crackdown you know, to me, that just says like it's there is no intention among anybody serious to uh, to deal with any of these problems, yeah. just to to continue guarding a shrinking social order of people who count. We're also barely going to do that. Uh, I mean, yeah. like none of this is even enforceable, even if people wanted to. They shouldn't want to. If you see someone shoplifting, you should ignore it, right? But like, even if you'd like decide to make an issue of it, it will be a drop in the bucket and it will be a pain in the ass and like it will change nothing because of, you know, our beloved material conditions. And besides besides that, besides that, uh like shoplifting is an essential it's a pillar of British culture. You know, we built this country on shoplifting. We went around the world. We shoplifted stuff from country after country after country. You know, and we didn't even we didn't even resell it on stock. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right. If you if you wanted like a set of marbles from Greece, we just had those in the pocket, like in the secret pocket of the tracksuit bottoms. We were gone out the door. And now, <laughs> a couple of hundred years later, we're acting as if this is some like huge, uh, unprecedented crime. You know. 
<laughs> yeah, if you want to go see the spoils of shoplifting, then I welcome you to the Tower of London, <laughs> and you can see what made this country great. It's, it's very funny to describe, like, the Koh-i-Noor as having been shoplifted. I mean, accurate, but, like... <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. there is, like, another component to this, because, like, on the one hand, you do have, like, the shoplifting, which is there for, like, you know, in reflection of cost of living crises, mm. and... You know, you have other forms of shoplifting, which are very much to do with people wanting to make, you know, who do it in order to resell, right? Like, that, you know, it, it's not to say that that doesn't exist, sure. um, but it's more to say that, like, the conflation of the two in service to kind of building up a moral panic um, is kind of the more cynical element to this. Because, like, the reality is that, like, you know, even if the government and, like, all the media organizations were serious about tackling this, like, that requires police or it requires, mm. like security guards and like if you're a private security guard who's very likely a contractor and a very low paid contractor at that like you know there are certain elements there are certain things where it's just like you know the risks are just kind of higher than yep. why would you bother right. why would you bother trying why? to stop someone who is starving for your minimum wage yeah. at that point unless you, unless you are like inspector javert right like it's not worth getting a knife pulled on you over like you know this you know the sort of evil organized crime reseller who is going to like steal you know uh, five legs of lamb or whatever you know yeah maybe maybe people just like buying meat down the pub I, I, i'm going <laughs> to carry true. on now i'm going to carry on because there's the other there's one other thing right i think this sort of ties in which is the uh the final scrapping of the triple lock on pensions mm. and uh you, know, you thought you is, were safe you yeah. old fuckers no you were wrong you, you you thought you were inside the wire no wires changed again um we did an episode about pensions a while ago mm. where it, we did one of those like half and halves where in the back half I like talk to an academic. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the thing to remember about British pensions is that they're very ungenerous. Even even with the triple lock, all that happened is the triple lock preserved the state pension uh, to, for Americans who don't know what that is. It's that the triple lock made the state pension rise every year uh, by either the rate of uh, the rate of inflation uh, two point five percent, or like one other thing. It basically yeah. means that uh, you are guaranteed in real terms to never lose money on the pension. Same thing we were claiming we were going to do with the NHS, where we ring fenced old people against the economy. Yeah, well, the, so now the there is a broad uh, consensus that the triple lock is too too expensive to be affordable, and. I think on a cursory glance, I mean, the Tony Blair Institute and Onward both love to talk about scrapping the triple lock on pensions mm. to pay for, like, national service or ID cards. <laughs> and uh, it depends. It, take your pick. Yeah. But the, the, the point is, right, the triple lock on pensions is not particularly generous. Uh, a, pe a state pension is not enough to not live in poverty. It's, mm -hmm. it's a couple thousand pounds a year short to not live in poverty. Um and all that really it was, was it was one piece of Britain's mid-century social democratic architecture that wasn't residualized in the aftermath of the long 1990s, right? That's all that it was. It was the, it was the bare minimum thing that wasn't cut down to below the bare minimum. Well, it actually is below the bare minimum. It's just not as below the bare minimum as everything else. You know, and the thing is, right, they, the reason that it can be scrapped now is that the people who it pandered to, their support is not necessary anymore because they have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. No one is, there is no one who is going to rebuild, there is no one who's going to rebuild the state. There is no one that was going to protect it against austerity. And you know what? The work of austerity was done. The triple lock, it can go. They, they, that, that coalition now, not important because it doesn't really matter who gets in. I mean, it, it, talking about electoral politics like this is quite depressing but this is an example of the if this does get cut if this does get removed it's an example of the wire shrinking precipitously and yes those people those voters will probably abandon the tory party in droves but where are they going to fucking go starmer i had like whatever kind of freak mutant right-wing movement is yet to come perhaps yeah exactly that's that's the alternative the talk of scrapping it is like yeah it's it was all it was almost certainly always going to happen at least it held out this long i suppose hmm. Well, welcome to Britain. Uh, no, no littering, no vaping. Uh, welcomes careful drivers. Please die quickly. Yeah, <laughs> and don't and don't complain about it. That's the main thing. Just don't complain about any of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you do, that's woke. Yeah. All right. All right. I want to move on from news. I want to talk about a startup. Mm. 
Uh, this is a fun one. It's not one that I found via the news. It's one that I found um, by looking at um, a venture company, a venture capital company's portfolio, and then found that they had a bunch of shit written about it. Cool. Um, it's called Cloud Chef, and I'm just going to give you their three words. Oh, is this, is this Savory Vapes? No, I would. That would be cooler. Cloud Chef. It's right there. You know, in the name. But uh, no, I'm afraid not. I'll tell you what it is. Is it is Spotify for food? <laughs> Spotify for food? Yeah, Spotify for food. I don't see how I could make it any clearer. At, at the end of the year, I get my like Cloud Chef wrapped, and they're like, "You ate so much lasagna, dude! Like genuinely, <laughs> are, are you okay?" Of all the lasagna fans in the world, you were you were one percent. <laughs> yeah, you weigh nine hundred pounds. <laughs> you hate Mondays. So, so by so by that logic, then it's like a service that sort of. A database of like recipes for meals you can make, but ultimately it's still just kind of, you know, it, it advertises itself as being like, you know, we can introduce you to all these new recipes to try out, but ultimately it's like the same meal, but like slightly kind of jazzed up. Mm. You're saying you are so close. I mean, it, it feels like Spotify for food. There's like, but there's not really. He's trying to else. get me to like cook from the Ethel Kane cookbook. No, here's the thing. It doesn't give you the recipe. It gives you the food. Oh, okay. So just like. Uh, like a pallet, like a HelloFresh pallet of like stuff just arrives at your house. No, the f completed meal does. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is uh, this is fantastic. But it's like a Star Trek like replicator, but with no controls. Is it like a delivery thing, but it decides what meal you should have? They, they oh, give saying you're even. Closer. They give you a menu in prison. Like you get an option of like two <laughs> things at least. <laughs> 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 You're having the Mr. Beast burger again. I don't care if it's been four months. This is why that guy escaped from Wandsworth, is he couldn't face another day of Mr. Beast burgers. <laughs> Please, may I at least have a Mr. Beast feastable? No, only the burgers. Not a Mr. Beast other branded content. She'll pass through Wandsworth prison. Um, no. So, what's for dinner? Memorable meals from the most iconic global chefs and restaurants made available to you locally. Uh-huh. So they're just gonna like I imitate and make something from uh, I also yeah so it, so it's kind of like uh, your advertise I don't know like Marco Pierre White's yeah. like fucking codfish but actually it's made in a ghost kitchen yeah. by some like guy from Bangladesh. Oh, that's fantastic. And... Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. That's that's the business model. You have nailed the business model. Who's right? So cool. fucking okay. evil. <laughs> so it's like, it's kind of like it's not it's like master class like you know there's master classes mm. where it's like they advertise the celebrities were the ones that like you know you can take a creative writing class with Salman Rushdie but then the actual app is just like I would love to take a creative can. writing class like an Ayatollah pissing off class with Salman <laughs> the Rushdie the heaviest <laughs> vetting for like a weekend master class you've ever seen <laughs> but like when you actually went onto the platform like because anyone could upload anything it's just like here's some guy sort of telling you like how to get back with your ex-girlfriend and like by using magic tricks or something like that. <laughs> Weird thing for Salman Rushdie to be telling me. <laughs> uh, so that's Hussein, you really are about 90% of the way there. Uh, so, imagine dishes, they say, from the most iconic- and by the way, th this was a press release that just got reprinted word for word in like four media outlets. Cool. Imagine dishes from the most iconic restaurants and chefs from around the world delivered to your doorstep. No passport required. Just order and enjoy. Food technology startup Cloud Chef has made this a reality with the debut of its proprietary recipe record and playback technology, which impeccably cre recreates dishes from any chefs, allowing consumers to enjoy their favorite dishes and recipes from anywhere in the world home delivered. Okay, so th this is going to fuck up spectacularly, right? Because there's no quality control. Well, I'll tell you, in blind taste tests, Michelin starred chefs could not detect the difference between their dishes and those created by Cloud Chef. Uh huh, okay. What Michelin starred chefs, you might ask? Yes. Why the ones who have been engaged by Cloud Chef and stand to benefit from the company going big? Oh, so, Marco, so Marco Pierre White is being like, yeah, fine, whatever. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is like my codfish. Yeah, it's, a, it's a perfect souffle. And it's like just kind of I don't like, give a fuck. Yeah. Wow, Anthony Bourdain said what? <laughs> uh, no, so uh, basically what they say is look, we can get. Uh, like a, a, a big chef to come into our kitchen, our proprietary kitchen. See, we've, we've already outmoded the traditional British little chef. <laughs> yeah, we have big chef that will be stomping on it. Um, you know, we have a, so a famous chef comes into the Cloud Chef central office, yeah. and then they cook a recipe like they would in their own kitchen. 
the Cloud Chef Central Office uh, is full of sensors, cameras, infrared sensors, oh, so you're, scales. you're doing it like the way they used to record music in like the 20s and 30s, where you like record a master and then they just kind of like go down off of that. Fantastic. Okay, I'm excited to get the kind of like wax cylinder of like a Gordon Ramsay burger or something. <laughs> so then they say this, the tech codifies the chef's intuition. So people have absolutely no context for this dish can recreate it. Uh, there are things that are very hard for humans to pick up that often get lost in written recipes, but are straightforward with sensors. So a chef like Thomas Zacharias may not cook his onions the exact same amount of time every day, but he cooks them to the same level of brownness every time. The camera looks at the contents of the pan or other appliance and checks against what was happening during the recording. It does things like measure the consistency of the dish or the amount of water lost to the atmosphere. So the idea is, right, uh, Marco Pierre White comes in, makes his codfish, or, yeah, or what like, have you. In my head, he's doing this in the kind of like motion capture rig in the like black jumpsuit <laughs> with all the bubbles on it. Yeah, he's moving like Smeagol. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andy Circus's lasagna, delicious. <laughs> delicious, but very involved. <laughs> um, so you, you go in, right? You get captured. And then the their AI system that surrounds you uh, will be able to beam that recipe to someone who works in, f like, who they get from Fiverr or whatever, uh -huh. to be able to make you Marco Pierre White's codfish, but without understanding what they're doing or why. They're essentially trying to make a Chinese room for food. Oh, delicious. A Chinese room takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, when asked, what are you hoping this technology will accomplish? They say, so, we are trying to reimagine the food industry, where the chef gets credit for their recipe and is not tied down by the constraints of brick and mortar. So Thomas Zacharias is arguably one of the- But, but chefs sell cookbooks routinely. Y you can already do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course you can, but not when- But if you're- If someone's going to make you Marco Pierre White's codfish, yeah. then they're- Then Marco Pierre White's not going to get a, you know, a- a fifth of a penny cool. every time you order can it. I, can, can I ask a very basic question as someone yeah. who doesn't like really eat at fancy restaurants yeah. like very much? Sure. Um, which is when I have eaten at a fancy restaurant, part of the appeal of it is that you go to the restaurant, yes. right? Like the atmosphere is sort of a big part of why you go. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a whole sort of like restaurant ecosystem. Like, you know, it, it's more than just the chef. But even if, even if you were able to cook Marco Pierre's cod, white wine like I don't, I don't know what what he does but if you let's say that like I've just been I've just been doing lasagna as a placeholder cuz I can't yeah, think say, of a second Yeah let's say that you got Marco Marco Pierre's white it's like lasagna and it's like it's codfish kind of, lasagna and it, codfish Ugh. lasagna is perfect <laughs> but then you still got to rely on someone delivering that to uh -huh. you which requires it to go into a takeaway box the temperature like mm -hmm. will be affected by that mm -hmm. the composition of it will be affected then by the time you get it it's quite likely that you probably have to reheat it to some capacity mm -hmm. so then it's not the dish, it's not the same thing. It's a different it's a different thing. If you've been to a fancy restaurant with an open kitchen, you will know that an essential part of the process of making like haute cuisine is uh sort of workplace abuse. Um every, every, <laughs> every sort of like uh, big name chef will have sous chefs who like or chef de party who will like make the exact same thing to spec, uh, and then they will need to like humiliate them in front of the entire brigade. That's like uh, if you don't have that, if you don't have Marco Pierre White slapping you over the back of the head and calling you a cunt, then you're not gonna have the like the dish as conceived, right? Because this thing isn't you know, you know the the work of art in an age of mechanical reproduction has to include a kind of robotic Marco Pierre White, right? Otherwise <laughs> For the birds. So, you know, they and they say, right, do you, do you think this technology has the potential to save fine dining? To which I can say, should it be saved? No, probably not. I mean, yeah, it, it, probably it, it's not. just regular dining, but you melt like a stick and a half of butter into every spoonful. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Thomas Zacharias, one of the chefs that's one of the like, Michelin star chefs that's working for these people, says, yeah, because it's an additional source of revenue. And especially now in the age of social media. So I didn't know we were having this interview from 2016. Mm. This is from this year. Uh, chefs and restaurants finally have fan bases around the world. Um, look at Apple. None of Apple's stores are necessarily profitable, but the They're idea. They're not a restaurant either. They're a different <laughs> thing. They're a different thing. They don't even sell apples that. <laughs> You're going to the Apple store and asking for the you can't apples. Even dude, you, dude, you can't even walk into one with an apple. I walked into one eating an apple like years ago, and they were like, you've got to finish your apple outside before you come into the store. 
It's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, it's very, but- very sort of like primer to semiotics there, you know. <laughs> but the idea is that they've built such a great brand that they can monetize it around the world. These amazing chefs and restaurants have brands, but they don't have distribution. We want to do that for restaurants. Uh-huh. But it look, I don't, I, I, I don't know this world very well, but Apple's, app, the appeal of Apple and the, the branding of it is because it produces the same product around the world, mm. right? It's a ubiquitous product. That's why it's known, because there is a universality and a compatibility to it. I could move to another country and bring my MacBook and I would sort of be fine, right? Mm. But like... The point of like a restaurant, especially a fine dining restaurant, is that there's only one. There's one, mm. maybe two, but they're called different things, even if <laughs> yeah, they're the same. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're just trying to look, your venue's making a franchise, you may as well just do a fast food. You may as well do Mr. Beast burgers. Yeah, I genuinely. don't understand any genuinely. of this. Well, also, it's like, what are the other things that you experience when you go to a restaurant is you're with people out in the world. Mm. You're not just like sitting at home being like, ah, time for my like... You know, t- time for my nine-course Marco Pierre White Michelin-starred feast, prepared by a Fiverr guy in a ghost <laughs> kitchen in a fucking, like, a shipping container that I'm going to eat while watching the goddamn Netflix. It's, ridic- it's fucking ridiculous. I'm glad this will never mm, take off. Codfish lasagna. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, from, from another article, right? Uh <laughs> <laughs> this has managed to like offend and piss off all of us for different reasons, which I I think I I really cherish, you know. Hmm. So how it actually works, right, is that the AI is trained by pro chefs, um, and then amateur cooks, meaning like just I get people who they can. You can't even throw a pan at an AI. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, uh, but right. The, the, and the serious note, right, is this is just an extremely. They're, they're, they're talking about what capital uses technology to do, which is break up and take more control of, of work to de-skill it, not even necessarily to automate it, but to make each worker more replaceable because their knowledge, their domain experience, their status as an artisan is demolished by the presence of a steam loom, or in this case, a lasagna loom. Mm-hmm. Um, lasagna loom. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and th- so what the idea being, right, is that the... What this is, what this essentially aims to do is create even more uh, inequality within the food industry mm. by making it like the performing arts industry was made by saying there will be a few, a small number of she- again, if it works, which it won't. Uh, it says there will be a small number of elite chefs who will make up the recipes and they will be scanned. They'll have their masters, and then there will be lots and lots of people who are completely disposable, who are who are working on the other end of this deal who are never going to really get the opportunity to, for example, I don't know, become skilled no, artisans right. who are just going to be only brands. the technicians. And only the same yeah. brand. This is a perfect way to ossify an industry, is the other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you, if you did this, all it would do would be to sort of freeze the entire restaurant industry in amber. Um, mm. And, you know, 50 years in the future, you would be like, oh, uh, you know, what genre of food do you want? Do you want, like, you know, Marco Pierre White or Michelle Rue, right? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, n- nowhere in that is anything new being developed. Uh, and mm. it, it sounds like it would suck, well, to be honest. The new thing that's being developed is the AI. Oh, great. Oh, okay. Its- yeah. So, like, y- y- you freeze it in, like, current year. Um, mm-hmm. we're all, like, eating- what, Riley, you need to, like, help me out with the thing here. What's something characteristic of, like, fine dining at, in, like, 2023? What's a fad that we- that we do uh, now? Uh, oof. Is, like, foam still a fail? No, no, that was, like, right. that went out in, like, 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, then it was the fermented stuff for a while, but then Noma closed. I don't really know what the fad is now. We're, we're all doing, like, wild foraged vegetables and stuff, right? And we're doing that forever. And if you want something different from that, then the third option is the insane cooking AI that we talked about when I was a supply teacher a couple of weeks ago that just suggests that you put, like, Mapo tofu and Drano in a dish and sort of, like, boil them <laughs> up together. So, what they say is um, that the these chefs will reduce their labor costs because you can, you don't know, you you can just be like a studio executive's dream, right? You're you're the studio executive, and then the AI does all mm. of the work for the you. It's just mobile. you need to have a bunch of you just need to have a bunch of disposable fiber people you never see, right? That's the difference. Um, and that cooks could be replaced by lower wage workers without diminishing the food quality. Again, this is said with pride. A chef's gonna be okay without the ability to, like, uh, abuse subordinates. 
But you, do you think before turning the frying pan on himself? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or he's just gonna, he's like, Marco Pierre White's just gonna find the server room and bash it to pieces with the frying pan. If you, if you can't do a small bump of coke off of your Audemars Piget and then go in and, like, <laughs> terrify a, a, a 19 year old in a room full of, like, very sharp knives, what even are you doing this for? What, what are you in this industry for? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, it says, with the AI guiding production, cooks could potentially be replaced by lower wage workers without diminishing food quality, and and chefs will receive a passive income stream from licensing recipes with the AI kitchen technology. Recipes from in-demand chefs and restaurants could be replicated around the world, bringing new flavors to faraway places without requiring the chef to travel and train. And as you say, Alice, therefore, never allowing any mixing of cuisines or cultures no, ever. No, of course not. The other sort of knock-on effect of this, presumably, is also... Uh, you know, because even if you, even if this was, again, it's not going to be successful, but like, say just for example, that like it sort of gets rolled out or tried out, um, you know, you're still using, you're still needing to like use quite advanced cooking techniques in these ghost kitchens, mm. right? Because with like the Mr. Beast shit, like kind of putting together a burger and stuff is a fairly automated process anyway. Sure. And you just kind of like, you know, it's not to say that that's not like a difficult job to do in its own right. But in terms of like cooking gourmet food, in terms of cooking high end food, like that requires a very specific skill set. Yeah. So, we're, skill, we're, get, we're, gonna, set. we're gonna have to make right. the Fiverr guys so, learn how to use a sous vide. Yeah. So rather than, yes, but like rather than sort of getting, you know, your sort of low wage workers who would work in a fast food restaurant to then work in a ghost kitchen you're now getting like kids from like who just graduated from the cordon bleu or whatever to then go into these ghost kitchens as well mm. and which is to say that like these you know where there may have been a pathway where you would sort of go from culinary school to like small time restaurant and then you would kind of you know work your way up to bigger restaurants and maybe you know become like a head chef or a uh Fuck, I, I don't know who else. Yeah, Saucier. right. Instead, like, instead, it's just like, well, everyone's going to be in a ghost kitchen. Like, that's your thing. Like, whatever happens, you'll be in a ghost kitchen unless you become like a big influencer, in which case we might let you license some recipes. It's, it's also it's also like so terrible for chefs, aside from the like abusing their brigade thing, because like it's sort of flying this white flag of surrender that your cooking is never going to develop or innovate from that point. Right, because you don't you don't have to do anything. We we have you made the cod lasagna. What else do you need to that's do? That's right. We, you, you have made that like Michelle Rue develops the perfect cod <laughs> lasagna and is then sealed inside Magneto's non-metallic prison. <laughs> right for the rest of his life, just collecting money on cod lasagna streams. <laughs> I I, I sort I mostly agree with that, but I think there's another way to see it. Right, which is. That when when the this tendency gets a hold of an industry, what happens is it becomes more like banking or any other mm. bit of professional services, where the link between the actual doing of the thing, right, between the actual, um, let's say in movies, right, the link between working your way up through a, becoming a production assistant, whatever, uh, is broken. Like all those links get, have been being broken for a long time. Right. The, the, and then what happens is you go to professional education and then you basically come in with a commission, more or less. Yeah. And if you're enlisted, you never rise above a certain level. And the, the point is, this is how if this wasn't completely fucking stupid, this is how you would do that for food. Right. Is that's how you would break that. Link. Imagine being like a sous chef or a commis chef uh, when this comes in, too. It's like you, you're you're sort of like your boss just decides to become Darth Vader. Right. And it's like, actually, no, I think I will rule forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how, how it would actually work. Right. They, they, a lot of the recipes are, are Indian because it was started in India, uh -huh. then as spar and is now expanded to Silicon Valley. Um, the person gathering up the ingredients in the company's kitchen will have no understanding of the, of the difference between turmeric and coriander, but that doesn't matter because they are instructed to pull spices off a rack, weigh them out based on a system of barcodes, and then a different person will collect the ingredients and carry them over to the kitchen's tech-enabled range and cook the dish by following instructions provided by a video monitor. These people have no understanding of, like, joy or creativity mm -hmm. or, like, just life generally, mm -hmm. not to sort of, like, wax lyrical too much, but, like... That sounds fucking horrible. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, yeah, this is an industry that is trying to crush joy and creativity and things. And th by disrupting it further, you're, we're just crushing it more. We're enabling the crushing. Mm -hmm. um, so they say, uh, there's no need to understand when the chicken achieves doneness or when the curry reaches the ideal thickness. The software does that from sensors that measure the thermal temperature of the ingredients and the relative weight of the food as it cooks down. 
I mean, this this is just an attempt to sort of like uh, implement the system of a fast food kitchen. Uh, it's also it's also misunderstanding like why people go to. Fa- I mean, again, like it's not even just like you go for the environment, but even if you're sort of thinking about it in terms of like the status that going to these types of restaurants sort of offer. Like to me, it sort of seems like it's a, it's a very kind of like tech idea of you know if you can replicate like a you know a fancy if you can replicate like a Marco Pierre white meal. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wish I knew more like fancy chef names. If you can replicate like replicate a Noma meal or whatever, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Then you can sort that of that would be so dangerous to try and do. <laughs> <laughs> Everything there just fermented and foraged. I mean, those are the two things I know: Marco Pierre white and Noma. If you can replicate one of those meals, then you can sort of say. Um, oh, I had, you know, I, I had this meal that like, you know, I, oh, I had a Marco Pierre white meal. And I wonder whether that's sort of the objective, but it's oh. like, well, no, you're sort of missing the point, which is that. It's, yeah, it's, it's philistinism. It's, it's the purest philistinism because it, it's going to this restaurant and going, okay, well, I assume that one of two things is happening here. People are eating this foam because either they really like foam or they really like the name of the guy who made the foam for them. And at no point in that is the sort of like, Labor, whether that's the innovative, like uh, intellectual labor, or the labor of actually making the fucking foam, like show up in this. I'm really looking forward to like the first complaint online being like my de- my delivery driver like ate all my foam um, <laughs> and, 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 and has left the box outside. And when I asked and when I asked him where's my foam, he told me to fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> The Velour Chicken Curry by Chef uh, Sri Gopinathan consisted of chicken breast covered in a mild spice brown sauce. It was Michelin starred restaurant. Gopinathan's Michelin starred restaurant Etan is not currently serving the entree, but it, it used to be. Uh-huh. The review is. Overall, this was not an outstanding Indian takeout dinner <laughs> compared to other local choices and did not seem up to Michelin dining expectations due to the lack of garnishes and plain presentation. But they go on to say that if it was cooked by someone untrained, it was basically competent, which is just, it comes back to, I think, that luxury and lifestyle tend to be the thin end of the wedge as to how these ideas get sold, mm. right? Because you're selling the idea of anyone can, anyone can be... Uh, a kind of you can you can get a kind of luxury indulgence through AI replicating it and making it mass available. What they really mean is we are proposing a way to completely de-skill the job of a chef. Yeah, I mean, because it used to be the case that Mr. Beast burgers were only available to Mr. Beast, and they took like a week to make. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, um, it's the 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 meanest standard of living of the worker worker today would be greater than th- that of the richest Mr. Beast in all of history. Um, anyway, so that's Cloud Chef. I hate um, it so a, much. Thanks. Yeah. Jeers to Cloud Chef. Mm. Uh, and now the pr- earlier, as promised, we got a buddy check the FT. Mm-hmm. Um, was they they have interviewed this shit the- don't mean nothing to me, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, they have interviewed. Um, the incoming Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Tony Blair. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, about how basically he intends to govern behind the throne when Keir Starmer is most likely elected. Oh, cool. Somehow Tony Blair has returned. <laughs> so the this is an, an interview, I think a an interview that is relatively uh, softball for Blair and likes to not asking a lot of difficult questions assumes, I think, quite a few, um, let's say, friendly premises. Mm-hmm. So not asking for, for him Blair. like why he's been working for the most evil fuckers in the world for the last two decades. Like, not two decades, one decade. Well, it says, um, it, it, it notes, uh, it, I'll just jump on. I mean, I guess he kind of was working for the most evil motherfuckers in the world like two decades ago. It was just George Bush. But... Yeah, it's a, it, they do mention... Um, they, they do mention the Saudi connection, but I think they don't challenge his ideas. Okay. Say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll get to it. So, Sir Tony Blair has warned that Sir Keir Starmer will inherit a, quote, country that's in a mess if Labour wins next, next year's UK general election, and that the party must accept it will not be able to tax and spend its way out of trouble. Uh-huh. No, we should just fucking hedge it all on the markets again like you did. Worked out perfectly. Yep, that's right. Country to put it all on red. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> absolutely not to put it all oh, on yeah, red. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and I mean, I think the reason I'm, I'm reading this as well, right, is that we've seen Blair emerge as a kind of almost advertising himself as a Svengali mm. for Starmer yeah, ever it, since. If you the, want um, sort of a, an Eminence Grease, you know, he's, he's around, you know? Mm. And. Um, and I think ever since the uh, the Tony Blair Institute's the Tony Blair Institute for Global Regime Changes um, 
uh, their conference where Blair interviewed Starmer, and it was essentially felt like this sort of the least sold professional wrestling work I've ever seen. Yeah, Bla- Blair sort of like putting his fingers together in like simp mode and being like evil, evil vizier tonight, King. The Tony Blair Institute is essentially poised to be to Starmer as, for example, the policy exchange was to Thatcher or something like Onward was to Theresa May mm. or Kristen Nemitz's Twitter account was to Liz Truss. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, this what and so what he's giving us is a sense of what Starmer is likely to do because we know what his policy shop is going. Yeah, to be. this is where the ideas are going to come from. Yeah. Um, I look forward to them eating shit once again on ID cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, whoa, whoa, just you wait. Uh, mm-hmm. Blair and Starmer would confront a much worse economic situation than the one Blair inherited, he said, from John Major's Tory government when he first won election in 97. Saying, if Starmer wins the election, which I think he has a good, a good chance of doing, he'll be the sixth prime minister in eight years. That's a country that's in a mess. We are not in good shape. Uh-huh. You could ask... Why does nobody trust politicians anymore? Why are people so disaffected with the political process? Ah, wouldn't worry about it. Things can only <laughs> get better. <laughs> yeah. He said, critics of Starmer, who said his policy offering was too bland. Bland? Would we say bland? That's actively harmful, maybe? Yeah, all of the sort of, like, anyone smoking a disposable vape will be executed by Judge Dredd. I find, like, what a sort of bland set of policies. Yeah, where's the spice? <laughs> in in the vapes, you know, which is yeah, why. that's right. It's, it's citizen, is that a paprika vape? <laughs> <laughs> um, but he says they were talking nonsense. And that labor has to stop equating being radical with just taxing and spending, saying the conservative party has taxed and spent to the point where we're in an economic crisis. We we must. The conservative party has been too generous with British people. Again, the, not someone you expect to hear agreeing with Liz Truss, but uh, this is the sort of the the Blair Truss nexus, right? Is the conservative party needs to cut taxes even more? Yeah, yeah, why will nobody cut the taxes mm-hmm. is, is what you say when you are, um, I'd say, like, removed from uh, the actual activity of governing the country so much mm. that you can just that you can just take and hold a ridiculous position. And it doesn't matter because it will get you attention, which is what you yeah, want. I mean, no one at the, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Regime Change is like banging on Tony's door saying that they need money from the government to do like any basic service because he's out now he's out of power and so this doesn't affect him yeah well they, and also the idea that the conservative party has taxed and spent to the point where we're in an economic crisis what did they spend on specifically uh, what was the spending that caused us to be in the economic yeah bathrobes that's it you know what was the level of taxation that caused us to be in an economic crisis what was the spending that caused us to be in an economic crisis if i recall wasn't the last economic crisis brought on by a among other things a tax cut that spooked global markets it didn't isn't that what fucking happened that's because of the markets were woke you know uh-huh. <laughs> um the idea that the Conservative Party is taxed and spent to the point where we're in an economic crisis, but you, of course we never talk about what it's being taxed and spent on, right? Mm. Uh, because very little of it got spent on doing the things that are keeping people well, or from the point of view of capital, keeping people working, getting people around. Very little of it is actually getting spent on that. And Blair's answer, of course, is this has all itself been too generous. <laughs> if, you, if you thought it was bad with almost no money, consider how much better it could be with no money. He says, the radical agenda today is all about understanding, mastering, and harnessing the technological revolution. This is why the podcast is what it is. This is the sort of, this is why we're so well positioned for this, is because this is the way that they've decided to sort of resolve this impossible contradiction that they've set up, right? Is the government needs to not tax, uh, not spend, not invest in anything. So it needs to do something that's magic. What's magic? Technology. <laughs> yeah, what's magic is that, oh, through AI and sensors, we can recreate a kind of not as good <laughs> version of a curry. Yeah, I mean, c- c- what wow. economic crisis Listen, can yeah. withstand the cod lasagna? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's the idea. And also, like, that was his radical agenda in 1997. That's what gave it the whole idea of, like, the information society, mm. the, the, the cognitive society that he pursued. Yeah, it was all posts, you know, and gave us all posting brain. And what happened there, right, 
is that yeah we created a, a, a we created a class of of, of like down, now downwardly mobile professionals with less and less valuable university degrees that are just stamps of entry to jobs and that didn't create a more um let's say geographically even global uh limbo workforce all it did was it was it was essentially just a kind of watch the birdie while the rest of the everything else was fucking residualized mm. They also don't really want to like invest in any infrastructure that would allow tech to sort of be that driver, right? No, of course not. There is like within all this is this expectation, and again, like very much one of the OG motives of the show or OG motifs of the show, a wizard will do it. Mm. And what they are really depending on is the presence of wizards, plural. <laughs> um, and you don't really need to go into details about it. Like one of the details that these guys do sort of bring up from time to time. I'm not sure whether he does it in the FT article or not. But the fact that like a bunch of AI people are sort of setting up camp in London and this sort of being an example of how like, you know, tech will sort of be the driver of social change. But again, it is very much the case of like they don't really elaborate any further on that. So like, what is the AI going to do? Mm. Also, and, yeah. it's worth adding. Do you know why all those AI people are setting up camp in London? Uh, because we have a gigantic amount of public funding for research in AI here. <laughs> uh, th this map UCL, UC yeah, UCL is one of the world leading AI research institutes. That's why they're all fucking coming here. Is because we're generating talent in a way that the market doesn't fucking touch. I mean, I was going to say that we're probably the only place that sells cod lasagna somewhere. <laughs> so that could have been. <laughs> this, th but also, this maps so well onto a sort of like uh, fantasy setting, right? That the evil vizier is like. We have to seek out the best wizards. You know, this is this is what the court needs: is sorcerers. We were used to be pleasing Ra back when mm. the the Nile flood was abundant. The Nile flood is no longer as abundant. So rather than say, I don't know, working harder on farming, we need more priests. Yeah, be nice to the guys with yep. uh, necklaces with crosses. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um. He said. Uh, Starmer had shown agility and determination in remodeling labor after its hard left predecessor. Was he on a fucking like dog obstacle course? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And look at it. Look at his stance and gait. <laughs> Very uh, glossy Star coat. <laughs> <laughs> he said Starmer had shown agility and determination in remodeling labor after his hard left predecessor Jeremy Corbyn. Adding, <sighs> I didn't give up on labor, but I think the Labor Party would have been finished if we had carried on under Corbyn. Well, you made sure of that, didn't you? Like. Also, why you are still responding to him? He was last leader of the opposition four fifths of a fixed term parliament act ago. But he also runs. But he also runs the country in a many people's hands. Genuinely, right? This is the last thing that actively threatened them was Corbyn. Uh, for like, and and not always for good reasons. Sometimes for bad ones too. But like, it was the only thing that's like even put a ripple on the surface of this. Like Liz Truss destroying the economy, just like suicide bombing the bond markets, that really didn't like make much odds in terms of like the like the Blair vision of, of like how government is going to be in the future. Corbyn did, and they will never ever forgive him for it. Well, it's be and this goes back to I think uh, what I was talking about with the triple lock, right? You retain these constituents. If you are if you are a residualizing government, you're a residualizing political tendency. You retain these these constituencies as long as it takes to dismantle and take apart what you want to dismantle and take apart. Then you no longer need them because it's really really hard. That the only thing that that can stop that is either the forestalling of that dismantling and taking apart, or rebuilding new things that will then have constituencies that don't want them dismantled and taken apart. And you know this the idea that that process would be stopped or God forbid reversed was absolutely anathema to Mr. ID cards. And so this is why they can't stop responding to him because they need to sell that it will continue to be residualized and taken apart. But I don't even know why they need to sell it because that victory is now won. It's just arguing over who does the residualizing. Um, so Blair's new mission is to persuade political parties not just in the UK, that they must embrace technology and change the way they govern. All, all the greats, the UK, Turkmenistan, Saudi Arabia. If Blair had as much power as MBS, he would have put a fucking neom crisscrossing the country. He would have bulldozed all of fucking Wiltshire <laughs> just, to make a neom. Just, like, bone sword Alistair Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> 
He said if this sounded like the kind of thing the current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak would wholly endorse, then it was a good thing because it might help Starmer to build a consensus in office. Mm -hmm. Again, it might also indicate that all of these people are on the same side, but hey ho. Um, And this is where he gets to generative artificial intelligence, saying... Generative artificial intelligence and other tech developments can revolutionize healthcare and the fight against crime, but only if governments understand how to use them. Getting, I'm going to get vaporized by the Blairite benefit scrounger drone when I like pick up a Mars bar and like forget to pay for it on the way out. Yeah, absolutely. The um, it's citizen. Is that an elf bar in your pocket? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he said the civil service had to be completely overhauled to reflect the coming change. Um, citing Dominic Cummings. Oh, uh, as having a similar idea. Uh-huh. Says, um, he cited Dominic Cummings' drive to recruit weirdos and tech nerds into the heart of government, saying, some of what he says is sensible, but some I totally disagree with. Well, that's a, so that's again, a vintage Blairism, too. Yeah. What, what is sensible? What, it's, yeah, the idea that, like, the, that the, a lot of the institutions of government are quite sclerotic? Sure, yeah, that's sensible. But the idea that you have to hire, like, a race realist blogger in order to, like, address that fact... Rather than, I don't know, stopping, not allowing the treasury to just hold a, a nuclear bomb under the country. I don't know, maybe that would help. Also, at the risk of making quite a conservative point, one of the reasons why the civil service is conservative and why it is sclerotic is because it has to run the country. And that's something that sometimes requires you to like act in a conservative way to keep the lights on. Well, it's that the civil service has to run the country while getting orders from people who until, I don't know, a, a week ago uh, were just like the backbencher from like like somewhere in Surrey. And, and the thing is, right, that it's perfectly valid to decide to overturn that. And it's, it's valid to sort of be a revolutionary and, you know, do sort of like Leninist Blairism, as Blair seems to be doing here. Right. But the question is, if you are going to overturn the bits of the state that like make the state function in order to replace them what are you doing that for to what end and is it to like make anything better for anyone who lives here or is it just to you know just fucking enrich your dodgy mates well it's that you have to you have to believe as i think blair does that it will actually make life better for everyone working here mm. and the idea is if only people would submit to the machine <laughs> all, all only best from the heart of the machine yeah i, I, I mean i i think no one has ever had so much faith in anything as Tony Blair has had faith that the the British person cries out in their heart for ID cards, you know? Here's the next line. Fucking hell. Blair has called for all citizens to have digital identification cards. Yes! yes. <laughs> Playing yeah. the hits. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He will never give up on it. Like, find someone who loves you like Blair loves ID cards. It was right then, and it's right... But just to I'll add one more thing on my sort of thing I was saying about, like, the civil service, it's like... If you're going to have a system of government where, like, so, where the prime minister can just say, "I like the look of that Liz Truss character. Let's put her in charge of the foreign office mm. because that let, let's just see how she does having a go," then you do kind of need them to be like sort of stymied at every turn. Yeah, genuinely, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it's like that is a profoundly undemocratic thing, right? It's something that should be changed. But as long as you're going to have the I'm going to give my mate a go at running like the department for trade, then you do need to check your mate's excesses. <laughs> it's profoundly undemocratic, but like so many things about the way this country is set up is profoundly undemocratic. Mm. And it's, it's you know, like, what are you, are you trying to democratize it or are you just trying to like destroy it and leave, you know, leave it in ruins and replace it with nothing? And, you know, what are you trying to do that for? Right, I, I think any of the any of the things that like a Corbyn ministry would have had to have done to the civil service or done to the treasury, for instance, would have necessitated a lot of sort of very dramatic excising of the same stuff. But I think it would have been, you know, for different reasons. I hope at least. So it says uh, on ID cards. It was right then, and it's a thousand times more right now. What, what? arguing who? When did he come to this conclusion, by the way? What, it, what made this the, his, like, white whale, you know? Probably he was walking around Mount Sinai, and God said, one more commandment! <laughs> just, like, one, just one more thing. Tony, you specifically have been chosen by me to make ID cards a requirement yeah, in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah, mate, ID cards is idolatry. <laughs> um, that's graven images, isn't it? Um, you know, it says, Blair acknowledges that while there are big worries associated with the use of ID cards, 
uh, that the tech revolution was coming anyway and that politicians needed to regulate it just as they did with health and safety rules in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Was it politicians who did that with health and safety rules in the wake of the Industrial Revolution? Can you remind me? I assume so. I haven't checked. I, it was it was elected politicians, right? It was mm. them. That was that was the one who did it. And they they did it because, they're like, well, I suppose industries here. We might as well make it so that you can't put kids inside the lasagna loom. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, the the thousand times more right now, the idea being, of course, that citizens need to be able to engage with the 21st century strategic state. But basically what he really means is more surveillance is necessary so that the state can achieve its strategic ends of controlling its citizens for their benefit. Of course, for their benefit. It's not you engaging with the 21st century strategic state. It's the 21st century strategic state engaging with you, which is what makes it yeah. strategic. Yeah, because you are the strategy. Part of the strategy might be that if you smoke a disposable, if you buy a disposable vape, then then we can, um, you know, cut off one of your arms with like a monofilament katana. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We got um, the cyborg ninja from Metal Gear is now going to be <laughs> <laughs> deployed against benefit sheets. Yes, yeah. It says uh, they also cite, of course, that Blair's post Downing Street activities have draw always drawn criticism saying that, yes, he is still providing advice to the Saudi government in spite of the brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. <laughs> that advice? You guys should do ID cards. <laughs> yeah, he's unapologetic, <laughs> saying, What's going on in Saudi at the moment is incredibly important. None of that takes away from the terrible crime of Khashoggi, but if you look at what's happening there, it's a social revolution. Which I can say, it sounds like you're taking away from the terrible crime <laughs> of Khashoggi, I don't know. I would say so. Also, all of the most social revolution things uh, get the activists imprisoned. Uh, for a long time, which is maybe not a great sign of a social revolution. It's it's a social revolution, but it's conveniently already happened from the king. Oh, it's it's so it's like a top yeah. down sort of controlled guided social. I see, right? One of those. Yeah, it's like what if? What if? Hear me out here. What if mm -hmm. King Louis, right, seventeen eighty, seventeen eighty five, right, says, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna make Marseille long. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, We're gonna so like I, I, I'm interested in the contradiction here between uh, the, the civil service, very hidebound, very ossified institution that slows the pace of change and tries to control and subsume any revolutionary change within it in a way that's profoundly detrimental to the interests of the country. Unlike the Saudi royal family, which is an innovative <laughs> startup based, the civil service would never. Build a line that you I know think is that's what true. Blair is that, saying that's true. Yeah, they would never start up a big fake company talking about the civil service would never produce a slick video talking about cognitive technology without defining what it meant. Mm. You know, the civil service would never uh, re try to replace the NHS with the metaverse. <laughs> never. And so, like, let's let's think about this, right? What is Blair's position? His position is that his he is going to be the policy shop for Starmer. Does policy shop the policy shop is going to have one product on the shelf? It's going to be ID cards, and it is going to allow what it's going to allow him to do. Shopkeep, I am going into battle, and I require your most your strongest ID cards. Yeah, uh, I'm going to fossy the ID cards at people. Um, but what is what what is this going to actually do politically? Is it is going to provide a program that will look like change mm. that will that will look like radical change? Right, but won't be because the things that keep you alive and safe and thriving are the same now as they used to be. Right, maybe the only major difference, right, in allowing the technological revolution to actually change most people, technology in quotes, obviously, change most people's lives, probably would have been free broadband for everyone. Yeah, it, uh, aside from that, it's more surveillance and uh, a worrying amount more fish in this lasagna than you're used to. Well, I can imagine that also the extended surveillance is being seen as like one of the key drivers of economic growth because if you sort of mm. build a surveillance state then you can also introduce companies that benefit from that surveillance state be it in the workplace where you can be monitored at an even more micro level uh there can be whole companies set up in london uh primarily uh measuring how much toilet time you spend uh in your office per day mm -hmm. um or, you know, in the case of the startup that we spoke of, like, you know, AI you know, or like, you know, identification being used to uh, punish you if you use the wrong amount of turmeric in uh, the cod lasagna. Um, and so I do I do wonder whether like the core, I think you, you might be right in the sense that the core of like the, the Starmer Blair change program 
is very much rooted in like what if we built an economy based entirely on surveillance because they certainly don't care about creativity they certainly don't care about innovation in like a very real sense uh they don't care about improving people's like mental well-being or physical well-being they don't give a shit about infrastructure but they also don't want to spend any money on anything else so what if like you built your sort of surveillance state but primarily without having to spend any money other than on like laminated cards and qr codes mm-hmm. i will contract those it, out too i'm sure oh yeah it, it, it it's never this the key thing here is none of this ever actually has to be done it just has to be talked about and announced mm. and looked into and and that anything that will get done will probably get done through things like the DWP, will get done through things like restricting the NHS, will get done through the Home Office. And raising moral panics, I yeah. think, is a very good way. Like, you know, to go back right oh, to no. the beginning of this episode where we talk about like shoplifting and stuff, um, you know, that can all like that can obviously be used as like very good precedence to being well. You know, we need these ID cards because, like, look at all this social disorder that's happening, right? All the sort of like crime that's taking place. All the, you know, uh, it doesn't matter well, about like Blair cites crime specifically as right. one th- one place he thinks that that the that Britain should be bringing in AI. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't say specifically how to the FT, of so, course. And, but... and and this is a really funny example again of just like, okay, we're not going to actually, even if we were taking this seriously. Like, we're not going to introduce, like, more police. No. We're not going to introduce more, like, you know, we're not going to, like, put more police on the streets and stuff. Um, because that, again, would require money. We're just going to replace them with AI. It's more shit you have to carry around. Have we, have we explored Blair's, like, possible financial links to the wallet industry? Maybe, maybe he's an EDC guy. Maybe yeah. he loves like, maybe he loves like small knives and to, like what, what carabiner saying? clips. <laughs> Just like me, for real. Is that, is that they are- what we're saying basically is that is that they are is that continuing on the proud Tory tradition of police abolition, but instead of just replacing the people from the town, he wants to replace them with ed 209 but he doesn't want to invest in ed 209 so it's going to be an id card and a cardboard cutout of ed 209 <laughs> that has a motion sensor on it that says halt citizen present your id card when you walk yeah, past yeah it. please rend yourself limb from limb with cannon fire if you don't have your id card because eventually your border your like volunteer border guards will want to eat food and if they can't afford food then they will be like hey maybe i should be getting paid for being a volunteer border guard mm-hmm. um but the ai doesn't have to eat mm. <laughs> So, this is, to finish up here, this is on his legacy and taking control of the party back. He says, we didn't have a credible labor leader in Corbyn. That's what gave us Brexit. Uh, Citation needed. What? Um, Asked if he will help Starmer in the forthcoming election, Blair simply smiles and says, I'll help in any way I can, but he will (laughs) want to be his own person. (laughs) You could just, you could hear him tenting his fingers, right? (laughs) Yes, sinister. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, he's like, he's just tired of being Svengali to like, mm. you know, to like take Turkmenistan. He wants to come and be Svengali at home. <laughs> he's going to come back different, though, from that experience. He's going to like be whispering in Starmer's ear, hey, have you considered like boiling all of the dissidents in like a big pot, maybe? Hey, 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 Keir Starmer, have you considered building, look, we have two great cities you can build. You could build Ashgabat or you could build the line. Which one do you want? I love working. I love my job working in 10 Downing Street where I whisper into the prime minister's ear that he should build a line uh, and also introduce uh, Sharia law. That's right. And look, it's, it's we're going to do Sharia compliant ID cards. We anyway. are close to it. I did see someone online today being like, you know, the like shoplifters should be punished like physically. Um, and, I, and I did think to myself, like, do you want to cut their hands off? Yeah, like yeah. Cold Singapore. Be- it's just public public canings, you know? Number one, shoplifters should be punished. Number two, I hate interest rates. No more charging interest on loans. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. The, pla- the plan, trust, trust in the plan. It is. Uh, it is. It is about to materialize. All right. All right. All right. This is a, this is all we have time for today. So thank you very much for being a free listener. If you like this show, there is a Patreon. There is five dollars a week for a second episode. We got a real humdinger of a bonus uh, this week. We're going to be talking about um, the new micro, uh, private micro uh, state being built in California by the LinkedIn guy because he got too mad at San Francisco Mm. Um, with friend of the show, Shanti Singh. So do check that out. Uh, Additionally, there is bonus content that is left on Red. There's Britonology. We have a stream. You know all the details. You know the theme song is Here We Go by Ginseng. You can listen to it early and often on Spotify. Spotify for music. They they finally made a Spotify for food for music. Uh, You can check it. Cod lasagna while listening to various uh, bits of episodes. That's right. Uh, I think that's all the plugs. We don't have anything coming up. So we will see you 
in a few short days on the bonus. Bye, everyone. Thank you.